everybody and a warm welcome to Cavanoma Alliance UK's annual forum. My name is Helen Evans and I'm one of the CEOs at uh, CA UK. So Professor Douglas Marchuk is a James B. Duke Distinguished Professor at the Duke University School of Medicine in Durham, North Carolina. He received his PhD in molecular genetics and cell biology from the University of Chicago and performed postdoctoral research in the Department of Human Genetics at the University of Michigan. So very, very um, experienced and relevant to this session. He has performed research on CCM for 30 years and Doug will be speaking to us today on how might gene therapy help and what progress is being made towards this. So Doug, thank you ever so much for taking time to join us today. It's a subject that hasn't been discussed that much here in the UK, so it's a real opportunity for our members to hear a little bit more about what is gene therapy and, and what could the potential benefits be in the future for our community. So I'm going to turn off my video and audio now and leave you to screen share and take the floor. Okay. First off, thank you very much for inviting me, um, and I, I'm I'm pleased to to give this talk. I, I will say, and I apologize that I just got back from visiting my son's family and my two year old granddaughter, who's 100% completely lovely. But she's a wonderful vector for viruses, and she gave me one. So, but that's something we'll be talking about soon about viruses. So, um, let's talk about, as Helen said, what. Uh, might gene therapy do for CCM? First, we're going to have an introduction about gene therapy, but even before that, I want to introduce myself from showing you our beautiful campus at Duke University. This isn't the medical center part, but um, some of you know that we had the uh, U.S. meeting um, in Durham this past fall, and it's a, just a beautiful campus, Gothic architecture that um, the Duke family believed that they they, they wanted to replicate what they had seen in Europe and other uh, prestigious universities, especially in the UK. And with local Riverstone, it's just beautiful arches. I love walking around the campus and, and the iconic cathedral, which is really, they call it the chapel, but you can see it's, it's just a beautiful structure. So let's start by talking about gene therapy. I wanna talk about in vivo gene therapy where you're directly transferring the cells into the patient which is what we're going to be talking about here for CCM, for uh, cavernous angioma. But a lot of the early progress was done on ex vivo gene therapy. And that's where the cells are taken out of the patient. The gene therapy is done in the cells and then the cells are transferred back to the patient. And you can think about like blood cells or something that are renewable, like white blood cells. You may be able to take some stem cells from the bone marrow, work with them, gene therapy, put them back the existing white blood cells will eventually die out and you'll be replaced by the new ones that you've done gene therapy. So the early progress was done there. It was a much simpler uh, task because you were basically working on cells that you could work on in the lab and not have to worry about the patient until you put the cells back in. Um, so let's think about some key considerations for even doing gene therapy, life expectancy. You can imagine the disease that's lethal in childhood is a good candidate for gene therapy because there's no other option. And, and you'll see in a minute that that was the early start for gene therapy. Loss of function versus gain of function. These are due to mutations. Some mutations break, essentially make the gene make a faulty protein that's lost its function. Some activate the protein, like it may be a switch on off and you've broken the switch so that it's constitutively or always on. So that loss of function versus gain of function is a key consideration. I'll describe that in a minute. But I'll say this, you can imagine it's, you can put some, something back in and for loss of function, but for gain of function, you've got to turn that switch off and that's quite hard. Dividing or non-dividing cells, cells that divide will go replicate and take over. So if you've uh, engineer them in some way to, 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 for gene therapy, then they will take over. Non-dividing cells, every cell has to be changed because you don't have that replication. Secreted from the cell or intracellular, is this something that's floating around in the bloodstream or is, it, or is the protein actually inside the cell? And then everywhere, is it, is it a disease that causes all the tissues and organs or is it tissue specific? Do we need to worry about that? How should we deliver the gene? Viral vectors? 
nanoparticles, lipid nanoparticles, we're all familiar with now with the uh, COVID vaccines, DNA or RNA. The DNA is the instructions, the RNA is the copy of the instructions that makes the protein. We're all familiar now with that because of the, again, because of the SARS-CoV-2 and the, and the vaccines. Direct injection, are we gonna inject it right at the site of the disease or, or are we just gonna to have to do it systemically by giving it in the bloodstream? Immunosuppressed or not? Do we have to immunosuppress the patient as in sometimes in cancer therapies or other therapies where to shut down the immune system so that when we deliver something, the immune system doesn't attack the drug? And can we give continual doses or a single treatment? And this last part is really critical, payment. I'm saying it in terms of insurance in the, in the US context, but who's gonna pay for this? So let's go back to those same ideas, but let's think about CCM. Oh, I'm missing something, there it is. Oh, I, I didn't realize that this was, I'm just gonna, sorry, it was only partially animated, I apologize. Life expectancy. One thing is, is that if we could do this, gene therapy might be long lasting throughout the life of you know, an adult. Loss of function or gain of function. For CCM, it's loss of function. So we could add back a good copy of the gene. And this is good. This is much easier than fixing and gain of function mutation where you have to fix the mutation. Dividing or non-dividing cells. The endothelial cells lining the blood vessels are generally non-dividing. That's not quite as good as I mentioned because it can't, you know, the, the, the smaller number of uh, uh, modified cells can't take over secreted from the cell or intracellular. The CCM proteins are all inside the cell. It's not quite as good because you can't, you could maybe fix a few of the cells and then get it in the bloodstream and then it goes everywhere. That's not quite as good. Um, constitutive expression or tissue specific. This is tissue specific. It's one tissue. It's the, the blood vessels go everywhere, but it's pretty good then because we can get it to the blood vessels. Viral vectors, yeah, this should work. And DNA or RNA? DNA should work. That's good again. Direct ingestion or systemic dosing. We might be able to inject it into the vascular system, but we might actually be able to direct it even into the brain vasculature by targeting in, in the head. Okay. Immunosuppressed or not? Hopefully not. You don't want to be immunosuppressed, but we might have to do that for some patients if we were doing for CCM. And um, we'll talk a little bit about more what that means in terms of the, the immune system attacking the um, the virus that's delivering the carb gene cargo. Redosing or single treatments, it depends on the virus, but generally multiple treatments are always harder because the second time, third time around with the treatment, the body now recognizes the virus and says, I want to attack it. And insurance in the UK, this may not be an issue, but I think this expenses are going to be really high. Okay, so let's think about the modalities. Um, gene addition or replacement. It's already been thought about for hemophilia, Pompe disease, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy. These are genetic diseases. And you're, the drug, the cargo, is going to be a copy of the DNA, cDNA, or exons. And CCM fits right in here. But there are other methods. When you have a gain of function mutation, that would be you'd have to silence the copy of the gene that has this added new function or this activated function that's otherwise finely regulated, but it's stuck on. And then you've got to use some really complicated tricks like uh, short hairpin or microRNAs, antisense, these, these, these oligonucleotides, these are ways of turning something specifically off. Gene editing, everybody's excited about this. And so far there's sort of an attempt at one case with this uh, system, but, but basically this is very much avant-garde. It's very, very new and experimental of trying to fix the mutation itself. And this is always going to be a little harder and gene regulation, maybe in a different gene that regulates the, the, the mutant gene. Oops. I skipped one. Yeah. Why did this? Yes. So, so most of gene therapy to date has been done with viral vectors. Why, why would you use a virus? Here's the reason why the, for millions of years, the virus has evolved to invade your cells. If it's a human virus, it's perfectly suited as we've learned, unfortunately with COVID to get into the cells. If it's COVID, it's going into the lung epithelium lining the lungs, and it's really good at that. And so we want to use viruses because they can, if we could change the DNA inside the virus, we could deliver a cargo because the, the, the virus itself is a great delivery system. And there's 
three that have been thought about for use. One, I'm going to start in the center. This adenovirus is, a, is an important virus, and people have thought about using that. The lentiviruses um, have long-term stability in the, in the cell, and people have thought about using that. Um, but we're going to talk about adeno-associated virus, AAV. And what is AAV? And AAV is an associated virus, just like it sounds. When people were studying adenovirus, they noticed some little tiny little virus, and it was associated with uh, adenovirus. And so they called it adeno-associated virus. And AAV is a defective virus. It can't replicate. That's actually really good for us because we want it to deliver the cargo, but we don't want to make a uh, infection. We want the thing just to deliver the cargo and then it's defective, it can't replicate. And it's, the, the negative is, is it's, a, it's, a, it's a single strand of DNA for the aficionados, but it's a, it's a rather small uh, genetic cargo. So it has limited space in the, in the virus to fit a gene in. The good news is it's generally non-pathogenic, as I pointed out, it's even defective. It has relatively low immunogenicity. That is to say that it, the meat body doesn't uh, mount a, a strong immune response, but it does, but it's, it's not as strong as some other viruses. And the key is it's dependent on a helper virus. So we can, in the laboratory, grow huge amounts of it with this helper virus and then get rid of the helper virus and then only have this virus that can only do one thing. It can deliver its cargo and then... And one... In the absence of the helper virus, it's, it remains in this latent life cycle. In other words, it's, it's just sitting there and it's not going to start replicating and causing problems. And, and this AAV has been used previously in gene therapy. So let's look at some examples. Case study one is this Luxterna. So this is a one-time gene therapy for a retinal disease and, and the individuals must have enough remaining cells in the retina. But here's the point I want to make. This is a particular AAV. We'll come back to this in a minute, AAV2. As I said, it's replication division deficient. There's all these details. But here's, remember we talked about delivery? This is not given systemically. This is a subretinal injection. So you're going right into the target of the tissue that's diseased. And it was the first AAV drug approved by the, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Case study two. Zolgensma. I'm not a good at pronouncing some of these. Um, this is the target of the cause of spinal muscular atrophy, okay? And this um, is, again, a loss of function mutation. So you're going to deliver the gene back and make the protein again. And um, it's an intravenous injection. So here we're delivering it systemically everywhere, even though we're trying to do the spinal cord, okay? And this, <laughs> this is the thing I want to point out is it, the single dose is, is extremely expensive. Whoops. I'm getting this. Uh, the single dose is about 2.1 million US dollars and it's only used once one dose. Case study three, and this is the last case I won't bore you too much, but this is another one-time gene therapy for factor nine. So this is a bleeding disorder. We're getting a little closer to CCM now. This is a different adenovirus AAV5. Again, replication deficient has all these details. And um, again, administered as an intravenous infusion. It was just recently approved. Look at the cost of all three of these. This last one, $3.5 million per dose. So let's think about in general, well, what's going on here is most of these have been gene replacement or gene addition. It's very, the, the attempts at clinical trials in gene therapy for silencing a gain of function mutation or editing the actual editing the genome are very rare, okay? But remember, we're gonna be thinking about add back. So we're in, in this blue category. So, so, so we have a lot of uh, history behind us as we think and move forward for CCM. I wanted to show this slide, even though it's very busy because there's all these therapy trials to watch. And, watch. and I, I wanna point out that these numbers here are clinical trial numbers. So these are in trials. So this isn't necessarily um, already standard of care. But the reason, main reason I want to point this out is these AAV serotypes. You know, in the flu, we say, well, this is the H1N1 or the H3N3, or, you know, every season it seems to be a different virus takes over. That's, that's the coding of the virus on the outside. The capsid has different 
proteins on it. And so the immune re response has to be to that, those particular proteins, which is what it sees. Well, there are about a dozen AAB serotypes and they're slightly different. And they all have different, what's called tropisms. That's they go to different tissues. Sometimes one will like this AAB1 has a tropism. It, it likes to attach and, and enter into muscle cells, the central nervous system and the heart. And you can see all this. So the future of gene therapy for AAV is twofold. And I've only got one slide here to try to discuss both. One is to evade immunity. You remember I told you that, that AAVs in general are less immunogenic, that is they, you know, the body mounts an immune response to it, but they still do. And especially if you uh, deliver a huge dose of that virus the first time, your body's gonna mount a response to that virus the next time it comes in. So what my really, uh, one of the world's experts on adeno-associated viruses at Duke University, Arvind Asakhan, my colleague, and he'll come up in a minute here. And he, he does something called structure-guided evolution. So what he does is he says, look, we can reconstruct what the surface of the capsid, the, the coating of the virus looks like, and we can tell by some mapping where the proteins are and where the, where the parts are that are really immunogenic that drive this immune response. And let's mutate them and let's make them different. And he tries to do two things here. He's trying to mutate them to evade the immune response, but he's also trying to shift the, the trope. So let's say if this virus naturally goes to the liver, but we want it to go to the brain endothelium, can we at least get it so that it likes to go there more? And he has some tricks and he'll evolve these things. So, so what I'm gonna tell you about at the end is a virus that doesn't exist in nature, and that's the virus we're using because Dr. Asakan has really tried to get it to both evade immune system and also go more to the, um, the endothelium anyways, uh, the, the blood vessels in other words. So the key point here in this story is, is that preclinical, that is before the getting it into the human, animal studies are usually required for approval. You're not going to go generally not going to go directly into a patient before you've shown some efficacy, some usefulness with uh, animal studies. And so what do we need to accomplish this? Well, we need a robust and faithful, faithful meaning the uh, model, the faithful meaning that we that the, the 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 disease in the animal really faithfully resembles what goes on in the human. And we've worked very hard at that in my lab. And I'll show you that in a minute. And then we really need an efficient gene delivery system. And that's where my colleague Arvind has really come in because he's evolved these viruses that, that are not AAB1 through 12, and they have funny names, but um, because he's, they're, they're, they're genetically engineered. And so, he, and so he's going to come in with us. And then we need a rigorous way to evaluate the disease in the mice. We have to see, is it working in the mice? And, and my colleague that I've worked with for 20, 25 years now, Dr. Awad, who's a neurosurgeon, is um, on this team as well. And we're gonna, he's gonna help us look at the mice because he sees patients all the time. So he can also do that for the mice. And our study was finally approved. And I, I almost hesitate to say this because we were expecting it every month. And then I thought it would start in June. And then I thought it would start in July, but the, the federal agencies are a little slow at uh, fulfilling their obligations. But we, as soon as we get the go ahead, we're gonna do it. So what are we gonna do? Well, the first thing we need is in a faithful, and robust, meaning, a, you know, like we can really see the disease animal model. So this is our mouse CCM type three model. And this was developed by Matt Detter, who's a double doctorate and a medical doctor and a PhD. But at the time he was just a graduate student in my lab. And then now he's gone on and he developed this model. And, and this is a gross image of a mouse brain taken out of the mouse, the mouse has been sacrificed. And you can already see that by P21, maybe some lesions, but you start to see lesions, especially in the hindbrain and the cerebellum. And then if this micro CT is a way of looking three-dimensional through the tissue, and Dr. Awad has really worked hard on developing this tissue, this method. And you can see that even by P21, you're starting to see the lesions, but boy, by P45, there's huge amounts of lesions in the brain. And when we do histology, when we look at the lesions, like slicing the brain and, and looking at it, you can see these multi-cavernous lesions filled with blood. So this model is faithful and robust. It's it's um, really strong. It, it'll give us a, a, a point which we can see if there's a reduction in the lesion burden. The other thing that's important is the lesions increase with age. That is, the, as the animals age, you can see 
P35 means postnatal day 35. These mice are 35 years, 35 years, 35 days old. That these that mice are 42, you see more and more lesions. And by 70, you see this beautiful lesion burden. This is huge lesion burden. But that's nice because we could have a, we have a high ceiling so we can see if it drops, right? And um, I want you to hold on in a placeholder that somewhere in between here at P60, that lesion burden is going to be pretty high. So hold on to that thought that by P60, we've already got lesions developing, okay? I, I, I may be going too fast. Yes. And then the other key point is, is that the lesions should hemorrhage. And we were able to show in the, la in the late stages, this is P, so this is four months, a four month old mouse. Uh, a mouse would be sexually mature by just under two months. So this is maybe the equivalent of a 30, 25 year old. You can start to see, and this is a histology slide with a pearls iron blue staining. You see this blue stuff that's outside the vessel? This is iron and iron only can get out. Iron is in the blood, right? Because iron is in the heme, hemoglobin, the, 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 the red blood cells that has, are stocked full of hemoglobin. If heme gets out and, and then iron gets out, it stains blue. So we can see that some of these lesions even show hemorrhage, which is a really key point. Because if our model needs, is going to be faithful, it needs to actually show some bleeding. Because we may not be able to shrink the lesions. We hope we can. But if we can stop them from bleeding, that would be a wonderful outcome. So this is a little bit of a cartoon or schematic version of our study design. Basically, when the pups are born, that, that, that's what they look like, by the way, if you're interested. Um, that's called postnatal day zero. They're just born. And we follow them every day. And then, and then this tamoxifen injection is for the aficionados in the group, but we're going to knock out the gene. We're going to delete the gene. In other words, make a big mutation in the gene by P6 with this trick here with tamoxifen and a um, tamoxifen inducible Cree, but, uh, but you don't need to know that if you don't want to. And then by P7, we're going to begin, you know, starting at one point, we're going to be at least one of the arms of the study. We're going to start injecting our virus and we're going to end it at different days to see what happens. Now, I, I want to point out just in case this is lost. We're not following each mouse and give, doing an MRI. That would be prohibitively expensive. So what we're doing is we're killing mice at different ages. Sorry for the word killing, but that's what we're doing. And then we're taking the brain out and studying it. So it's called a cohort study because we're not longitudinally following the study uh, animals. And so here's a little bit of our study. And, and this is the, 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 the federally funded study that we're gonna, like I said, hopefully begin soon. I want, this whole aim one is all about science. If we uh, knock out the gene, but give the new virus even before that, so we're, we're giving the virus with the, with the gene cargo, adding back the CCM3 gene, and by, by 14 days, which is still they're being weaned, do we make new protein? Have we re, 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 are we making protein? Then maybe a little bit later, we'll go out to all the way to four months, which is our endpoint for the study. Is it still there four months later? This is really important because if, if it's not, if the protein isn't being made, if there's some hitch or problem at the front end, there's no reason to see if there's any efficacy because the protein isn't being made or it's not staying long enough, okay? And then, and then in this yellow and in this green is the actual study. So we've got a lot of science first, right? But then we're gonna see in AIM2, can we inhibit the lesions? So you're gonna see, we're gonna give the, the, the gene cargo with the recombinant AAV very early on. And we're gonna just see if, if we can even stop the lesions form because we're giving it like basically at the first day of life. And that, that could be done in CCM for inherited cases because we already know we could do a gene test immediately upon birth, okay? And then AIM-3 is maybe the thing that's the most exciting, but the most potentially uh, difficult. And that is, um, in this green, we're going to see if the CCMs can regress. And remember, I told you to think about the fact that at P60, postnatal day 60, there's actually lesions in the mouse brain. The, the CCMs are all over the mouse brain. So then we're going to deliver. And we're going to say, does it halt any further growth? Or perhaps it makes them even regress and get smaller. That would be the greatest outcome. And there's one final outcome. What if we don't change the lesion burden, the number or size of the CCMs? but we stop them from bleeding. 
And that would be an outcome that we'd be very happy with as well. And that's why we're going to also, when we take those brains out, we're going to do histology and see if we don't see that blue iron outside the, the lesions showing that they were bleeding. So that study, like I said, I was hoping it would commence in March or April, then paperwork in June, uh, uh, maybe later this, maybe July 1st, let's hope for so. So I, I think I've done, and I just wanna give you some take home lessons if there's too much science here. Number one, gene therapy for other diseases is really starting to show some progress. But to date, most human gene therapy are in clinical trials and they're ongoing. So we, we ought to think that this isn't like, oh, CCM so far behind. All of this is ongoing and it's still experimental for the most part. And these therapies to date, as you saw, are quite expensive. This, this is extremely experimental. This is not off the shelf items. You have to make these viruses, et cetera. Um, I think, I, well, obviously I think this, the gene therapy for CCM is, might be feasible. And we're gonna test that in our preclinical study in mice so that just, we can determine, well, just how likely is this gonna be? And if it shows good efficacy in any of those outcomes, lesion inhibition, lesion regression, or even just merely stopping the bleeding, I think that there's a strong possibility that governmental agencies will say, we'll move forward in human patients, okay? So I, this is the last point, and it's just a, um, something I always like to tell people is, please consider enrolling in clinical trials for research. And that those could be as simple as a, a drug, you know, like the, the, the maybe people are thinking about, but you know, someday there might be a clinical trial on gene therapy, and it would be nice to have uh, people enroll and 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 get, and uh, see how this works. So I'm stopping there um, because I'm done. <laughs> and Thank stop you. share. Thank you ever so much, Doug. That was a, a fascinating presentation, and I'm mindful for some members. You know, there will be bits there which they're you know I think on a on a Saturday afternoon they'll be sort of <laughs> churning over a bit because it's a lot of new <laughs> information for us as a community. <laughs> And just to share my own personal experience, I used to be CEO of Drave Syndrome UK, and I'm really passionate about gene therapy as I saw that um, developed for that community. And uh, for those who are joining us today who aren't familiar with gene therapy, it can be absolutely transformative. And I'm thinking particularly about members here who have the familial form and where carcinomas are identified very, very early on in childhood. If we can get this kickstarted <coughs> and we get a gene therapy that is then licensed for use in humans there's a potential that when a child is age one or two we could deliver this gene therapy and you know the the um ideal would be to stop growth but if we can't stop growth as doug there said at least to try and stop bleeding um so there's you know it's a very hopeful opportunity but as doug has said you know this has been kickstarted in the us already and there's a long way to go in terms of um testing with mouse models before we can get anything new to clinical trials in humans. Um, so what I'm now going to do is open this up to uh, to questions. Um, and I can see we've got one question here. So I'm just going to read that out. So Doug, this is from Heather, who is our newly appointed chair of trustees. So Heather Dunbar says, thanks for the presentation. Great to understand a little on gene therapy. What drives the cost of the treatment? Thank you, Heather. Yes, um, that's that is a fantastic question, and and people have thought about this. Um, I, I'm not an economist, uh, economist, excuse me, but I I'll say this that to deliver to to make a big batch, a huge batch of of these viruses, well, even once you've done all the science and engineered the virus, put the gene cargo in to create these viruses is expensive. You've got to have huge incubators full of lots of virus. The other thing is, is that this all has to be done in an environment that's drug ready. So in Aravind's lab, my colleague, he makes virus all the time, but it's not in, he would never, and we can, that's the virus we're going to be injecting into the mice, but you'd never be able to put that into humans because it doesn't meet the standards of a drug to live, you know, a drug that could be going to humans. So it becomes very, very expensive with, you know, clean rooms and special rooms that have to be, you know, um, meet all sorts of regulatory requirements. I think the other thing is, is it's very expensive. And it, and for some of these genetic diseases, they're so rare, so that the cost, it's not very common. So the cost goes up because it's not broadly uh, given to a large number of people. 
I think that's it. Th there's one more point I want to make that people have criticized the viral vectors. It might be cheaper to make you know, like lipid nanoparticles or some of these delivery systems that are, for example, we're used to the vaccine where they're not biologicals. You still have the problem of having all the regulatory issues of the cleanliness and sterility of the environment, but they're sort of synthetic so you don't have to grow the virus. So, so you know, I, I always think of this, the drug we, and I apologize for the long answer for short question. The drug we give today might not be the drug we give 10 or 20 years from now, the delivery system, for example, but it's better to start than to wait. I could really echo that. Um, and it's, you know, it's a fascinating area of research. So I've got a few questions to come up. The next question was asked by Dr. Ellie Chilcott. And Doug, just to let you know, Ellie will be coming to the US Scientific Conference. She works at UCL and uh, works in gene therapy research for rare neurological conditions. Excellent. So Ellie says, lovely presentation. Are you able to tell us a bit about the novel AAV capsid that you briefly mentioned? Yes, yes. So it, it has a funny name, CC.47. And Arvind, Dr. Asakhan in his lab, sort of, uh, he, there's two things he's doing. He cycles through mouse, human, and sometimes monkey to make sure that it can infect all these species so that we can do experimental work in the mouse, possibly even go into a like a monkey or something if, if the FDA Food and Drug Administration requires it, but it's still the exact same virus that will go into the human. So they don't say, well, that's not the same virus. So you have to redo, repeat everything. But the other thing he's done is he's mutated. He does this um, sort of um, sequential mutation. He, 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 uh, he mutagenizes key residues, tries to grow it in, in our case, in endothelial cells. And, if, and obviously by, uh, doing random mutagenesis on these key residues on the on the capsid surface you know who knows which which mutation is going to work but the one that works he repeats he grows it up then that they sequence all the possible ones that uh, the, the viruses that grew resynthesize puts it you know but mutagenized with other residues goes back through endothelial cells so he's trying to iteratively create a system where it has a tr it's changed its tropism so I didn't show you this data. It's in our, <laughs> our grant, our federal grant, to show that this virus, CC47, actually goes to the endothelium. And if I may, because this is a scientific question, we reversed it to see if it would work. We said, I showed you that we can create, um, uh, by, by knocking out the gene, we can create CCMs. So we flipped it. The gene cargo for CC47, the, the, the recombinant adenovirus, wasn't um, the CCM gene. We took a normal mouse with the flox deletes and we delivered Cre. So we delivered the, the recombinase and we made CCMs. So we knew it was getting to the to the vascular and cerebrovascular endothelium because we could create the disease. So if we could create the disease by delivering the knockout system. We think then we could replace it. I hope that makes sense. And, and I didn't show that, but that was a key point in the science. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Doug. So I've got a couple more questions. And if anybody has any other questions, please do put them in the Q&A or um, Mark just acknowledge I've seen yours in the chat as well. So this is a question from a member, uh, Pat, um, who is um, also a, a, a very eminent scientist as well, um, but is asking this as a member for other members. What differences are there for gene therapy for familial and sporadic cavernoma? Yeah. That is a very good question. Uh, clearly, we're thinking, at least at this stage, of thinking about the uh, familial cases because we have this potential, at least, for a huge lesion burden, and we obviously each lesion cannot be operated on. So the first point I'm making is, is that gene therapy almost certainly will go into the familial cases first. That's how we're doing it. I I think how can I put this? I think that um, I think that if it works in the familial cases, it possibly could also work in the um, sporadic cases. I just wonder whether the delivery needs to be directly at the lesion itself, because there's no reason to add back the gene everywhere when there's only a region, you know, one place where there's a lesion, and and I don't know exactly how that might be done, 
But I think the hope is, is that if it shows efficacy in the familial cases, we can think about ways of delivering directly to the to the lesion. So it, it may be that we just still do systemic delivery. I don't I don't know that that's the case though. Thank I saw you. a question in there, and I don't want to, Helen. I don't want to usurp your. Uh, no, please go ahead. <laughs> about great. about how long it's likely that this is going to be in uh, patients, uh, essentially, and the answer is, I, I wish I knew, but. I think I, I don't want I'm putting pressure on myself and Arvind and, and Dr. Awad, but I think that if we have really strong data with this mouse model, I think it's going to be hard for the regulatory agencies to say, well, we don't want to see you go move forward. I, I, that's my view. I, I think I think someone will say, this is just too important not to do. If it's kind of, you know, okay. But I think there may it, it may actually slow things down a little bit because um, maybe maybe a drug may be also okay you know slightly reduce the lesion burden. So I think we have to. Uh, this is a baseball analogy, and that's a U.S. game. I apologize, but I think if they hit a home run or at least a triple, and then I think the agencies will be happy. The, the, beyond that, it may be another decade or something. But but I think you know I promise you that the people working on this are not wasting time we are anxious to get this going and i think i see connie on the call from the alliance to cure cavernous angiomas in the us we're anxious and 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 the foundations are anxious the patients are anxious the scientists and physicians are anxious we'll push as hard as we can and i think that just for those not so familiar with the trajectory of this type of research unfortunately we're not going to be talking in one or two years, although we'd love right. that. And yes. say, we're talking at least um, 10 years. Yes. Um, and just a point to say is, you know, at the moment, this research is taking place in the US. And as we said at our AGM, for those of you who joined earlier at Cavernome Reliance UK, we're really thinking about how we can give even greater emphasis to research. And we want to kickstart basic science research in the UK because it's not currently happening. So we're beginning some early conversations with UCL about how can we start this type of work here, have our mass models um, explore, um, because otherwise we're going to get left behind. <laughs> and, and, and there's real opportunities here. So it's an area that we're actively exploring. So two more questions have come up. Um, so uh, we have a follow up from Pat. Will the cost of AAV gene therapy always be so expensive? Is this because of production limitations? I do believe it's because mostly because of productive limit production limitations. Although the the issue again of the you know the the scale and the you know costs go down as this as the number of potential patients goes up, I think that will always be that that can't be changed, right? Because that's has to do with the incidence in the population of the disease. But um, I think the production costs will go down. I. I'm not an expert at gene therapy. I'm more of a basic scientist, but I will say this. I do think that perhaps longer in the, I, I think the initial studies and the, if there is a clinical trial, it will be in an A, recombinant AAB. I think some lo longer term, uh, th there'll be other delivery systems is, is my view. And, and that actually, let me rephrase that. People who really know the field feel that way, that ultimately this, these lipid nanoparticles and other delivery systems will take over AAV. But right now, the viruses are absolutely um, key to getting into the cells. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, then, and I did this calculation once and I've forgotten what the number is, but the number of endothelial cells just in the brain alone is astronomical. So, so we really need efficient delivery. Thank you. And just in terms of cost, so, um, it's such an important question because we can prove that it works, do all the clinical trials. But for example, here in the UK, the NHS, we need them to then want to buy this for people. And we've right. got to show that cost value. So, um, you know, these are really important questions for our community. Um, so we have a question now from Jana, who Doug, you'll know, is the yes, um, um, yes leads uh, the European <laughs> Federation. Um, so Jana asks, can you say something about PIK3CA and MAP3K3 for those who haven't followed the latest science? And, and maybe, Doug, if you could just begin by explaining for those who are not familiar what those terms mean. Okay. So I, I, I'm going to back up even further and talk about the difference between the germline mutation and the somatic mutation. We know that for the inherited cases, 
you've inherited one mutant copy, if you have the familial form, of one of the three known genes that caused this. So CCM1, 2, or 3, really cleverly named, by the way. Um, and then once you've got that mutation, you've got a normal copy still sitting there. And that's why otherwise the, the, the you know, perfect, perfect uh, health. What we've, what we've now shown, we and other people, but especially my lab, has really focused on this idea that the, the lesions are seeded by a second hit by mutating the other copy so that you now you always have two copies, one from mom and one from dad, that, that in the one copy is mutated, that second copy is mutated. But what we recently showed was the CCMs that are surgically removed from, especially not only from these familial cases, even in the sporadic cases, they have additional mutations. They're not inherited. They're only in the cells in the CCM. And PI3 kinase or PIK3CA is this, uh, the catalytically active subunit or the, the, the part of the protein that uh, PI3 kinase. PI3 kinase is a central hub in growth. If you think about a, a really complicated pathway diagram, sometimes there's hubs in the pathway that really drive things forward. And PI3 kinase is one of those. What it looks like is the most aggressive CCMs not only have this loss of function mutation in the remaining normal copy of the CCM gene, but then they gain this mutation that activates. This is a gain of function mutation. So this is a very specific mutation that turns the PI3 kinase on and it, it's a driver, it drives growth. That's a somatic mutation. The good news is, and I'm gonna start with PI3 kinase, pick 3 ca as, as the acronym. PI3 kinase is not, only, it's such an important hub in these growth pathways that it's also involved in a lot of cancers. That means that pharmaceutical companies have been trying to figure out how to inhibit PI3 kinase activation for cancer. Now we're talking about huge amounts of money going into research in pharma, who has more money than, than I do uh, in terms of research power and more manpower. So there are already known PI3 kinase inhibitors. So this is a good news because you're not stopping the CCM but if the most aggressive ones seem to have this additional growth driver in the lesion, that and, and pharma drug companies are already trying to inhibit this pathway, we can sort of capitalize on their hard work for decades and their huge amounts of money to come up with the drug. So <laughs> without going into details, in parallel, and it's, it's really rough going, we're already doing a drug study in our mouse model that inhibits this pathway, although it doesn't directly inhibit it. It's, it's, it's rapamycin, it's a downstream target for the aficionados. MAP3K3 is just another somatic mutation that can offset, that, that, that does the same thing as loss of CCM genes. But the point being is, is that I think this PI3 kinase story is very important because it might allow us to repurpose a drug that pharma has been working on for cancer for CCM. And Doug, that's that, such, that, yeah. yeah, I think, and that's such um, you know, an opportunity for us as members, thinking, you know, there aren't enough options at the moment, um, and those options are very invasive. The yes. potential to see the repurposing of um, you know, other other fields of research is incredibly exciting, um, and hopefully can accelerate. Uh, the research in respect to this. So um, we have another question has come up from an anonymous attendee. Please, could you say a bit more about virus-free gene therapies and the time scale for their development? So we focus, you know, a bit more on um, on looking at viral vectors. So if you could tell us about some of those alternative options that you you referenced. Yeah, like the lip nanoparticle, lipid nanoparticles, whatever. I I, I can't say that anyone that I know of is trying that for CCM, although I may be incorrect. Um, so I think this is just an exploding field. And I think people who are in this field, and I am not, have really developed this already. And I think and to, to me, this, you know, if there was a silver lining for the COVID pandemic, it was that there was like a, an incredible influx of money and people and really smart people thinking about these lipid nanoparticles. They had already been thinking about that and this mRNA kind of um, uh, vaccines. So I think that these, I, I don't have a timeline for that, but I do think, as I pointed out, I, I think 
you know, that that'll be the future eventually. And, and I think that not because I know this, but because people have been saying this, the people say, look, look, we, we can avoid that immunogenicity idea. We can avoid um, this idea that you can't repetitively give dosing. We can avoid all sorts of, you know, concerns about the fact that you're using a virus if we use these part lipid nanoparticles. But um, yeah, I mean, but look at the therapies that have been going so far. They're all almost all in this recombinant AAV space, adeno associated virus. So yeah, when, when is it going to come? I, I don't know. I, I, can I, Helen, can I just say something? I think this PI3 kinase that you asked me to speak of, I think there might be very quickly, at least an attempt of some PI3 kinase inhibitors in humans, even if they may not be direct inhibitors, they may be this rapamycin or rapalogs as they're called. I think that'll happen hopefully very quickly. Way, way more before we're all, and, and they, they will be off the shelf or novel drugs. They won't be these $2 million treatments. They will be pills or injections, yeah. Thank you so much, Doug. So I'm just checking in the chat and Q&A, does anybody have any other questions? Well, just we'll just give people an opportunity they'd like to ask any other. I think, you know, I've been really struck by your passion for this. And I think <laughs> as, a, as a community, we need scientists who are passionate and to complement the clinical research that's taking place. And we heard from Professor Rasta Malshahi Salman, very excited exciting with a care study and um, that he's progressing and alongside that in parallel to have this basic science research and to have people like yourself who are passionate and moving that forward for us we're very grateful for because we need all those options to be explored so I'm just looking I don't think we have any more questions so so just for members you know in terms of um oh just some lovely feedback coming through in terms of members in terms of next steps so what we're going to hope to do at Kavanaugh and Reliance UK is to convene um, a science advisory board. We don't have one in the UK at the moment for uh, Cavanoma. We want to do that. We want to form a relationship with an academic institution who would be interested in starting that research. And we've begun some discussions with UCL. We'll see how those progress. And then we can start that research. But what we hope, and Doug talked about this, is then you want a pharmaceutical company with bags of money to come along <laughs> and uh, and take all that learning and then really take that to scale. So this is going to be something over a long period of time, but we wanted at this annual forum to, to start to share what this means alongside all the other important work that's um, that's being done. So, um, you know, thank you so much, Doug. It was um, a really enlightening presentation. This has been recorded. I know it's a lot for people to digest. I'm certainly going to be playing it back several times and looking <laughs> things up. Um, we're also going to do another presentation on gene therapy at the end of July. So um, Ellie, Dr. Ellie Shawcott asked a question earlier. She's going to the US conference. While she can't present on the co content of that, it's confidential. She's going to do a follow up presentation for people who haven't been able to join today just to share in real lay terms what <coughs> mean so we thank Ellie uh, for that um, and uh, we've got some comments there from uh, Connie in the chat as well who we'll be hearing from very soon so Doug is there anything else you'd like to say to uh, the members who joined today before we wrap up? No, I just want to reiterate what you've said Helen this is that we are passionate I can promise you I uh, just the other day I was wasn't sleeping and I was it was like it was like about two o'clock in the morning and I had an idea and I came into the lab the next morning and said hey I got an idea so um we're passionate, and and I know you are passionate, the, the patient uh, mm -hmm. groups, and um, we just encourage you again, if you hear about a clinical trial, if you hear about research, please join in and, and help um, by just being a participant. Well, I'd really echo that. And um, for those who were here when Rustam gave his presentation, um, there was cynicism about whether he could reach the target numbers for recruitment. And you can't get the funding if you can't recruit enough people. And he did. And that was really down with massive thanks to our members at Cavanaugh Alliance. UK a lot of you put yourselves forward so it's going to be the same when it comes to gene therapy research we share the information we're not going to twist your arm you've got to be informed and, and take those decisions and we'll give that information impartially but it's just it's 
they, you as members, have a real opportunity here to help us move that understanding forward and to improve things. I know for some of you, you've had your bleeds um, and you'll be thinking, well, what can I do for the next generation to make sure they don't have to go through what I've done? So, Doug, thank you ever so much for giving up your time on a Saturday. We're going to bring this um, part of the session to a close now.